And joining us now, George Friedman. He is the author of The Next Hundred Years, a forecast for the 21st century. He's also founder and, co and CEO rather, of Stratfor, the very well-known international private intelligence firm. It's good to meet you. Good to be here. We've had some of your associates on this program from Stratfor many times, so we're well aware of them. The United States, unquestionably the dominant power of the 20th century. And I guess the first and obvious question for you is, do you see it maintaining its hegemony, if that's an okay word to use, in the 21st century? I'm not sure hegemony is the right word. I mean, hegemony involves domination and in some way suppression. The simple arithmetic facts of the United States are this. It's larger than the next four largest economies in the world combined. Japan, China, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Industrially, it's deindustrialized, but that means its industrial output is only larger than Japan's and China's combined. It controls all of the oceans of the world, something no power has done in human history. And a final fact I want to throw in, uh, Japan's per capita, uh, Japan's population per kilometer is 365 people. Germany's is 260. The United States is 34, not counting uh, Alaska. We have enormous room to grow in the United States. And when you take all these factors together and become very impersonal and just look at them, and you ignore all the headlines and everybody's excitement over current events, you see an enormously powerful country, none rivaling it. Isn't that number, though, about the population density a bit misleading? I mean, in, in New York and Los Angeles, people are living on top of each other, and then you've got great swaths where there's no one. So, I mean, and it, the, it's uh, not as, right? Well, the way I would put it is, um, New York, Washington, Los Angeles represent less than 15% of the population in the United States. Cities like Minneapolis, cities like Austin, Texas, where I come from, where Dell Corporation is located. The United States is a very diffused country. And it's its diffusion and its land use pattern which is the most interesting. You go to Paris, you go to France, you go to London, you go to Britain. You go to New York, you have not visited the United States. <laughs> the size and the enormity of the country, like that of Canada, is just extraordinary. Hmm. You mentioned a second ago about the United States having control of the major waterways of this world. And we've got a map that we can show the U.S. naval fleet locations in relation to the major international shipping routes of the world. And as you look at this map, can you comment on the significance of this in terms of projecting American power internationally? I mean, those red lines are all over the place. Essentially, the U.S. has what we call negative control. We can't force anyone to trade, but we can stop people from trading. One of the nightmares of the Chinese government that they're always gaming out is what if the United States decides to blockade southeastern China? Uh, they're constantly looking at the question, how could they survive? Obviously, the United States has no intention of doing it. But you may have noticed the United States is not always the most rational and calm country <laughs> in the world. And when you combine the enormous power of the United States with the fact that it's not particularly stable in the way it executes its foreign policy, you get the sense of how it could control patterns if it wanted to. Do you see, I know, I know for example, in Europe, there is, there is, you know, they're on the verge of panicking over the demographic challenges that they have. They're just not replacing each other. United States, of course, doing better than, than many of the Western European countries. But do you see a looming demographic challenge for your country? Well, first of all, the population explosion is over. Birth rates everywhere in the world are plunging, including countries like Bangladesh. So, I mean, this is a sea change from the past 500 years, and it's extraordinarily important. Uh, the European countries have particular problems, not only because their birth rate is plunging, but because they're very bad at managing immigration. They don't integrate very well. The birth rate of the white native population of North America, of the United States, has actually plunged. The reason the American population is rising is because of immigrants who are reproducing at a much higher rate. The United States is very good for all the noise about Mexicans at integrating um, uh, immigrants. And that means that we have a stability in the United States that you might not notice in Europe or Japan. And that presumably adds to the, the reasons why you think the United States will still be at the top of the list in the next century. It's one of the crucial things because clearly the Europeans are not going to be able to maintain their position. Germany, for example, is probably going to lose a quarter of its population in the next 30 years 
it's going to be very hard to maintain your position in that circumstance. Want to talk about Russia? What's going Russia, to happen with them? Russia is in even worse condition. But I mean, it's not a Russian problem, it's not a European problem. It is the problem of the advanced industrial world. Uh, it's very simple. To have a baby right now is the highest form of conspicuous consumption. It is expensive. Uh, in, in agricultural society, they guaranteed your retirement. Today, your kid isn't going to be working at least 20, 25 years old. <laughs> He's consuming. And so having large numbers of babies is economically irrational. And in the advanced industrial countries, everybody is having much fewer. Those countries that can handle immigration efficiently are going to naturally do better than those countries that can't. Hmm. China. Many people, of course, see China as a great looming threat to the United States. I know you don't like the word hegemony, but let's, um, we're in Canada here. What do you want to call it? You want to say control? You want to say uh, supreme influence? Or dominance is dominance, how I like okay, to think about dominance. it. Dominance. You, you don't see China the same way. You don't fear China the same way. How come? Well, firstly, China is a third world country. Of 1.3 billion people, about 1.1 billion have a standard of living not particularly distinguishable from Nigeria. Uh, s incomes of below $1,000 a year are quite common. The second thing is the Chinese don't sell their products to the Chinese. The Chinese primarily sell their products overseas. They're hostage to the economic conditions in other countries. So the way I put and the United States is the most important of these countries that it sells to. So when the United States catches a cold, China catches pneumonia. And people talk about China withdrawing its money from the United States. So if the United States were really pushed into a depression by China, China would probably implode. Uh, the unemployment rate in China would surge. And unemployment in China does not mean what it means in Canada and the United States. It means malnutrition and starvation. So the Chinese are not going to do anything like that. They're going to do everything they can to keep the American economy going. But the problem of China ultimately is that it's a hostage state, hostage to its customers. In which case do you see China staying united throughout the 21st century? Well, this is the problem. The interests of the coastal region that trades intensely with the outside world and the interests of the interior are very widely united. The coast is, in fact, quite prosperous. The rest of the country is impoverished. When Mao faced this problem, Mao did the long march into the interior of China, raised a peasant army, and rectified the situation. Beijing now is desperately trying to balance between the demands of the impoverished interior and the internationally focused uh, coastal regions. Historically, China has not been able to do that for a very long time. It has either closed off itself, as Mao did, or as was the case before the British arrived, or it's opened itself up and wound up in extreme regionalism. Our expectation, my expectation here, would be that China will wind up in regionalism again. We're seeing the increasing power of the party structures in Shanghai and elsewhere. We see China sending the People's Liberation Army and security forces into southeastern China, cracking down, not allowing YouTube to be forecast. We see in China a government extremely concerned about its situation. Are you going so far as to forecast the end of the Communist Party there? I don't think the Communist Party will fall, but it's going to evolve from an ideological entity to a system of controlling events, particularly at the regional level. And I do see rivalry rising in the Communist Party. It's already there, rivalry between the center and the periphery. Where do you see Japan going in all of this? Well, Japan is the world's second largest economy. Uh, we ignore it, but it's much larger than China. It has the largest navy in the Pacific. It has an army about the size of the British Army. Its air force is excellent. And this is while it is officially unarmed. <laughs> Um, Japan is a country with a huge problem demographically, though. Its population is falling. The traditional Japanese solution to demographic problems has not been to import migrants. Mm -hmm. It is to transfer its industry to other places. Now, let's assume that it transfers its industry to China, which it is, and let's imagine China becoming unstable, which we think it will become. Uh, Japan will have to protect its commercial interests. And we're in a game that we saw play out in the 1920s and 1930s, 
when Japan had a similar problem, not quite the same, it did massive investments in China. China destabilized. The Japanese had to protect their investments against the instability. They sent troops to China, and that kicked off an entire unpleasantness. Indeed. But it was not because the Japanese were, you know, crazed imperialists, as people like to think. They had a serious problem of how to build their industry, and they solved it in certain ways. So do you see an increasing militarism entering Japanese society? Not if they can help it. But <laughs> the problem is, you have to understand that Japan changes. Before World War II, it was an intensely militaristic society. Then it was a rapid-growing non-militaristic society. Then now it's a slow-growing non-militaristic society. To understand Japan is to understand how quickly it can change. Remember something, that Japan in 1860 did not have a single-powered machine, not a steam engine or anything. Fifty years later, it defeated the Russians at sea, and today, of course, is a great power. Japan is the most dynamic country, and you always make a mistake by assuming the way it is today is the way it's going to be. Well, that's, of course, the, um, that's the underlying thesis of your whole book, which is to say, look, don't look at the world today and expect it to look even remotely the same in 100 years' time. Um, and I like the way, actually, you take us 20 years by 20 years by 20 years through the 20th century to show how things change so much. Uh, let's stay in, in uh, Asia, rather, for one more, and that is Russia. You are... I think, positively bleak about what's going to happen to Russia. How come? Well, I mean, Russia has ceased to be an industrial power. It is primarily an exporter of primary goods, not only energy, but wood, gold, what have you. Uh, it is a country that is trying desperately to restore its power, and here I will use the word hegemony, in the former Soviet Union. And it is facing an increasingly hostile United States on this. Uh, in the short run, Russia has a tremendous opportunity because the U.S. has created a window of opportunity by being off balance in the Islamic world. Hmm. Overly committed in Iraq and Afghanistan, nothing available. Putin is taking advantage of that. But as we saw in the Cold War, number one, a long-term confrontation between the United States and its alliance system and Russia is not a winning proposition. So I expect to see serious problems with Russia in the short run. But over the next 10 or 15 years, I don't see how they can sustain themselves. But uh, I think you've described the country as about to fall apart or break apart. What, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that during the 1990s, the Soviet Union collapsed. There was then extreme tensions within uh, Russia itself as parts of Russia wanted to break off Karelia, the maritime provinces. This was contained by Putin. He pulled it all back together. And he sustained it. And high energy prices helped him a lot. So he's created a kind of network of controls through the old KGB, the old intelligence network, and so on. But underneath it all, there are a lot of people, for example, in the maritime areas of Russia who have greater interests in common with the United States and Canada in their trading patterns than they have with uh, Moscow. So there are centrifugal forces in Russia. He will contain them for a while, and the United States is going to be a engaged in a confrontation with the Russians, as we've seen begin in Georgia. But over the long run, it's just very difficult to imagine the Russian Federation surviving. Does it break up into several new republics, or is that how you see it happening? Well, it consists now, it's called a federation because it consists of a range of republics, and we saw one civil war in Chechnya, which is currently under control. But I see a fragmentation not only of Russia, but also of China. I mean, what we're really looking at, in my view, is the fragmentation of Eurasian heartland. Uh, the area that was held together by two great powers, China and Russia, is fragmenting. China, you have to understand, has four uh, subordinate satellites. Tibet is one, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, and Manchuria. None of these are necessarily happy under Chinese control, but these are the buffer states. When you take a careful look at both countries, Russia and China, you see the fall lines. And if you project prosperity forever, then this won't happen. But if, as I do, you project serious economic problems in both countries, fragmentation is the most likely outcome. Let's talk about space. Is America going to militarize space? 
America has militarized space. Uh, in Iraq, whether you are uh, an infantry company using GPS to guide you, uh, communications to control you, whatever you are, you are dependent on space. We have militarized it and we will continue to do so, particularly because any power that ever goes to war with us knows that it has to destroy our space-based capabilities. So the United States has now based its core military power on, in space. Will there be wars in space? Of course. There, where human beings go, there are wars. War is the most ubiquitous process people have. Will humans fight those wars in space? Some humans will fight them, but there'll be a lot of robots and machines and other things. I mean, look, if in 1900 I described to you the Strategic Air Command of 1950 or the <laughs> air battles, you'd have thought it was science fiction. If in 1950 I had described to you the precision guided munitions that we have. So one of the things I say in the book is be practical, expect the impossible. <laughs> and what I mean by that is technological evolution, particularly in warfare, is so striking that in a 50-year period, you can't recognize what will happen. Does the fact that there will be more, I guess, machine fighting machine in space and fewer person versus person right. combat in space mean that war will be cleaner in some respects? Yeah. I mean, in the 20th century, we reached the height of mass warfare, where societies were throwing themselves against societies in annihilative battles. The advent of the precision guided munition is a non-trivial event. Previously, in World War II, to take out a factory in Germany, we had to destroy the city. Uh, now we're able to fire two or three projectiles at a building and know within 90% probability that it will be destroyed. The collateral damage declines dramatically. Uh, the effectiveness of uh, the system increases dramatically. I mean, it's very interesting to me that in Iraq, we have only lost, the United States has only lost 4,000 people. And that even the kind of mass casualties that we saw in Vietnam didn't occur. Uh, we need to study that. I mean, something important happened there. 130,000 uh, American troops were deployed, only 4,000 were killed. Now, that's a lot my daughter fought in Iraq, but it is still stunning and we are seeing the beginning of this decline in the lethality of war. Let's look at the other side of space. Uh, if, in fact, we're running out of energy on the planet, who knows, peak oil, pick your favorite theory, presumably there's a solution somewhere up in space. What do you see? My view is that space-based energy production is the future, and let me explain why. Uh, the hydrocarbon economy has had it. It's had it both because of cost and because of effects on the environment and a range of reasons. We need to go to solar energy. Well, solar energy is very difficult to do for three reasons. First, clouds, then darkness, and the fact that it would be an ecological disaster. Because to put enough collectors on the face of the earth to run an industrial economy, uh, you just have to cover all of the southwest United States. Space has no clouds, has no night and you don't have to cover up anything. It's vast. Um, NASA right now has a program underway for space-based solar energy. And the plan there is to create these collectors in space and then beam them back to Earth. And beam back is microwave radiation, convert them back to electricity, put them into the grid. The interesting thing about this, this requires no breakthroughs. Uh, these we are all the known technology. technology if we want to do it, and we have to evolve it, of course. But my expectation is that the United States, in the course of wanting to free itself from geopolitical threats to hydrocarbons, will move to this in a very inefficient military way uh, and begin sustaining itself that way. The United States is an interesting country. Most major evolutions, such as the internet, are based in the military. The reason the microchip was invented was to help guide uh, guided missiles to the Soviet Union. They needed a tiny onboard computer. So whenever I think about evolutions in the United States, which is a highly militarized country, you look to the military for what they're going to do. And they're doing it. And they're doing it. Mexico and America. 
Why do you see a looming showdown between these two countries? Well, in the first place, the United States and Mexico has some very serious unsettled business. The United States occupied northern Mexico in the middle of the 19th century and has done everything it could to destabilize Mexico in the interim so that Mexico has never been a threat. Mexico today is the 13th largest economy in the world. It's it bigger than most people think. It's much bigger than most people think. And it's an interesting fact that as I wrote the book, I realized most people don't really understand the new order of nations. They don't think about Mexico as having reached number 13 and growing fast enough to be in the top 10 very soon. Uh, we also have an immigration problem. We have a lot of immigration in the United States, and they're settling almost exclusively in, in the old Mexican territory. So it's the borderlands of the United States are being resettled by Mexicans. Uh, Mexico is becoming enormously powerful. Uh, we are going to have to deal with them. Well, we're showing a map now of the Hispanic populations in the southwestern United States, and I, and I guess the, the looming question that that suggests is, can you imagine a time when, you know, for lack of a better expression, these states become secessionist and want to join Mexico formally? I, I expect to see a movement in that direction toward the end of the century. Of Look, the 21st century. Of the end of the 21st century, yes. Um, when you think about it, when the United States went to war with Mexico, most reasonable people would have expected Mexico to win. It had a much larger army, was commanded by French generals, it was extremely sophisticated. No one would have expected the Americans to win. There were reasons they won. There's now the idea that the United States, and this way I use the term dominance, uh, is inevitably not going to be challenged by anyone. My point is, it may not be challenged by the ones you think, but it is going to be challenged, and the challenger is going to be this enormous giant to the south of us with a very bad attitude <laughs> about the United States. I, I, one of the first things I did when I picked up your book was to go to the index in the back to find out how often you had mentioned Canada. Ah. And then I discovered there was no index, so that made that trickier. But I don't think you do mention Canada in the book. And we would like to think that we have some interesting, perhaps evolving role to play in the 21st century. Do you see anything for us? Of course. I mean, you are an, an important country. I think of you in terms of Australia uh, and many countries that are going to be important. But you have a population of about 30 million people and a continent that has over 500 million people. And you are not going to be a determining force. Uh, Canada is going to be a prosperous country, but a great deal of its prosperity is going to derive from its relationship with the United States. The bitterest pill for Mexico I'm sorry, for Canada to absorb, is the intimate relationship it has with the United States and the extent to which, whether it likes it or not, its fate and the fate of its major trading power partner is going to be heavily uh, controlled by that power. To be more influential, would we have to double our population? And even then, would that be enough? You would have to start selling to other people. Well, we do that. Not enough. And. There's a good reason why you won't, because the transportation system is there, and you've designed your economy to fit into the American economy. So you've taken a very rational course, and as a result, you're an enormously prosperous country. There's a price you pay for it, and that price is autonomy. And when I speak to Canadians, they want to have the benefits of aligning with this giant, and the benefit of being free to operate on their own. Doesn't work that way. It's a trade-off Canada has made. Hmm. I want to ask you one last question, and that is, how annoying is it for you that all of these forecasts that you put into this book, you probably won't be around to see whether or not any of it comes true? It, it's not so much annoying, because certainly there are people alive today who will see it. And as I said in the book, I mean, if my grandchildren read it and say, not half bad, you know, I'm ahead of it. But look, what I was really trying to do in the book is try to find out what the major forces were right now that are driving the century. So if I look back at the 20th century, what are the three things that really mattered? The fall of the European empires after 400 years, the quadrupling of the human population, and the revolution in telecommunications and transportation. 
the, these were overwhelming events. I did the same thing here. What are the really important things of this century? The rise of the United States, in my view. The collapse of the population explosion is ending. And the evolution of robotics and space-based systems. So I took those three things and I said, OK, we know there are going to be wars. There are always wars. We know there are going to be rising and falling powers. There are always rising and falling powers. Tell me what this means. And so I was really looking for the center of gravity of our time. George Friedman, it's a great pleasure to have you here on the program, author of The Next 100 Years, a forecast for the 21st century. Appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. <laughs>